Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, just to introduce myself, my name's Claire Louise English, and I have had the very great honour of playing both Nor uh, Paige Northwood um, in the Silent series written by Nell Patterson, and now Emily in her new book, Hide, which is what we are here to talk about today. So without further ado, I will introduce you to Nell Patterson. Say hi, Nell. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. So I've got a wonderful list here of questions <laughs> for you, which we're going to try and get through in half an hour. Um, to celebrate the release of your new book, Hide, which is out in the UK on the 9th of December yep. um, in paperback, audio and ebook. So in all good bookshops, folks, please go and uh, check it out. So first question, obviously, mm -hmm. we need to start with the kind of elevator pitch um, of Hyde, obviously, without any spoilers, if you can manage that. <laughs> I find this one a lot harder than my three previous books, actually. Uh, but no, Hyde is about a group of uh, seven bird watching nature enthusiasts who uh, go for a walk on Boxing Day on a completely deserted nature reserve and then they hear a gunshot and one of them is found dead and I'm gonna leave it at that I won't I won't go into any more yes yes okay I, I'm gonna have to be really careful as well not to give anything away as we talk so I um, yeah way look I suddenly say something <laughs> um so um one of the things about Hyde particularly and actually with with your other books as well, but particularly with Hyde, the, the place, the setting of the story is so important. It's so crucial to, to the story. It's almost like a kind of eighth character in, in a sense. And how, is that something that's really important to you to, to a sense of place for your, your books and your writing? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, for Hyde, it had to be, it had to have the right sort of, sort of atmosphere for, the the plot and again can't go into too much there but there need it needed to have the potential to be both dangerous and sinister in the right set of circumstances um but also it had to be somewhere um that was also beautiful and that would attract people uh, in a positive situation as well because you know we've got the group of, of nature enthusiasts who love spending time there and uh, so it had to be somewhere somewhere nice, uh, natural, but remote as well. It had, you know, had to have, have that kind of combination. I think with this one, it, it matters less where it is within the country. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have set it in Lincolnshire because I live in Lincolnshire, um, but it's, it's one that it didn't matter as much the specific place it was in the UK, but the actual setting, the nature reserve itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was important that it had to, had to be just right. And is it based on somewhere, a real place that you know from your life or? Uh, vaguely, yeah. It's, so the, the basic footprint of it is based on uh, one of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust reserves um, in Doncaster, actually, called Pottrick Carr. Um, so, but in, uh, in the book, it is far more remote than Pottrick Carr is, which runs right next to the motorway. Um, <laughs> I think if there was a motorway right nearby, uh, it might kind of spoil some bits of the plot. Yes. Uh, in the, in Hyde, um, but the and it is much bigger. I've scaled it up as well, size wise. Uh, again, for for plot reasons. But the basic the basic footprint of it is based on Pottery Car. And actually, when I was writing it, I was hoping I could maybe um, ask them if if I could maybe get a tour late at night or something, just to really get a feel for it. Uh, but it was during lockdown, and because uh. I don't live in Doncaster, I think we were. Even even when we weren't in lockdown, we were in different tiers, so I wasn't able to travel there, you know. So it was just one of those that I had to use my own memory of visiting and maps and things online. So, uh, but yes, it's still it's still in my head. That's kind but of where. Like, is that something you like to do when when you write to kind of go to a place and stand in it and be there in the dark or wherever you know when it's likely to be most creepy <laughs> Some, sometimes yeah I mean with with the silent series because they're set um in various places around North Lincolnshire mostly mm. um there are streets that I I know specifically where particular buildings are particular houses of characters the the initial murder in the first book 
I know exactly which road that's on. I know pretty much what row of houses it is. Wow. Um, I'm not going to say because I feel quite sorry for the people who live in those houses. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, I know which part of Scunthorpe each of these are set in. And I'm, I, I try and kind of direct people to the right area if, if they know it, but I'm not mm. being too specific. So, yes, I do like to. And my husband is very supportive in this this manner that that he he will occasionally say to me, I found a good place you could dump a body. And so, you know, we go for a drive and, and have a look. Um, obviously, it's always a fictional body. <laughs> but yeah, there, there are a few places that, you know, I've got kind of stacked up for, for future books, potentially, that, that will be good for. You know, when I used to, uh, me and my my ex-husband used to go for long walks in the country and every now and again, we'd get to sort of like a really wooded bit and he'd stop and he'd turn around and go, right, this is far enough, start digging. <laughs> that was his sort of ongoing joke. <laughs> I could just imagine you there with your notepad. Oh, yes, this is this is the place. Yes, yeah, well, it was it was a walk around pottery cart years ago, actually, that first started off the idea for Hyde um, because I was walking with, with my husband and... And yeah, it was it was quite deserted on that particular day. And and I thought, yeah, I bet, yeah. Hmm. Some, yeah, some creepy things could happen here. Yes. But so on that, um, obviously the we've talked about the place. It's it's clearly inspirational and important to the to the plot. But also, I mean, with Hyde, you know, there's some really strong relationships there central to the to the plot as well, particularly one of um siblings two sisters so are those relationships really important to you when you start the book as well I think when I'm actually in the process of writing the relationships are ones that develop as I as I write they're not something that I plan as much beforehand I'm a very thorough plotter with the action but with yeah. the interactions between characters less so that's something that develops as I write and as I feel I get to know the characters but I think the relationship side of things is very important and that's something that I work a lot on in edits because I think with any book the characters if you only see the characters actions and speech from their point of view then you only see one side of them but it's the same with a real person you know if you meet somebody you know they can tell you all sorts you can have a perfectly pleasant interaction with them but then if you see them interacting with somebody else you learn a lot more about them whether that's positive or negative. And so I think that's, you know, that's such a crucial part of, of who we are as people, how we, how we relate to others and how other people see us because of how we relate to others. Yeah. But I think that's, that's important then for the, for the workings of the plot, particularly with this book, particularly with, with the seven different characters. Yes, that must have been quite a challenge to, to sort of look at how the seven different characters interacted with kind of both their own thoughts and with each other mm. uh, that must have been quite um uh yeah brain <laughs> fog to get that uh, to all into correct and, and who'd said what to who I suppose you must have had to make yeah. notes on that yeah I well this is one that I did end up with with a big wall of post-it notes and every character had their own color mm -hmm. um partly so that I could see that so I had a spread of what what kind of proportion of the book was from each character's perspective because there are a couple of characters that I wanted more of and a couple of characters that have less I mean one doesn't have very much for for reasons that become very clear um <laughs> but they all have a say at some point they all they all have um have their point of view shown at some point um and so in order to make sure I was covering all the characters but not giving one too much to say yeah, I needed I, I needed the colour coding there. So all of them with the different colour post-its. Um, and there were a few that changed actually, that there was one scene from one character's perspective in that, so say it was a conversation between, um, I'll say Ben and Lauren, um, then I, I had written it from one perspective and I thought, no, actually this works better if it's from the other perspective. So then I had to rewrite the scene from the other character's perspective, but then it did fit in better but I think having written it the first time from one then helped me to improve the scene when I when I changed it to the other um, just helped me with how one of the characters would be reacting to the other one yeah so that that was going to be another question actually the mm. sort of process of that and whether yeah. whether you are a wall of post <laughs> and a lady um and I guess for this one because as you're saying 
some bits of the story you're just getting from one side of one character's point of view. So did you have to kind of plot the whole story right the way through and then decide which characters you saw which bits from? Um, I kind of I kind of did the thing, did the whole thing together, really. And mm. um, because they were kind of grouped in two groups of characters for, for a lot of it. So it was as well, there was focus on which group am I focusing on, right? Which character in that part? You know, kind of what comes next in the plot? Who, which group does it apply to? And which person in that group would be the best person to tell this particular bit of the story? Mm -hmm. You know, because obviously there are things that, there are some things you don't want to give away because that, you know, it's, it's a, crime novel it's a mystery you want the reader to be guessing and there are certain things if they were from some character's perspective then it would give away too much uh, so it's, it's working out which character would tell it best and which character is kind of most emotionally affected by that particular incident or that particular scene as well because that's that kind of comes into it in order to build that tension you need to make sure that there's there is that the way the the character's been emotionally affected by it and has your process changed for this book from the silence series or do you have a kind of process that you always go back to a way that you find that you work i don't think it's changed a lot i mean it, it did have to it was different because you know as we say seven seven different narrators mm -hmm. um with the silence series i mean obviously you know because you um <laughs> you were the are the audiobook narrator for page but with the silence series so we have most of it is from Paige's perspective and then there are flashback scenes um, from other characters perspectives. Now I write those, I write the flashback scenes last. When I write those books I write those last. I write the whole bit of Paige's perspective and then I divide it up and figure out what happens on what day mm -hmm. and then however many days there are that's how many flashback scenes I have. So then I have to go through the plot and think right this character that you need to know more about the background of that incident. This one you need to know what happened then. And then I write the flashback scenes. Whereas Hyde, I, I definitely did have to write completely chronological order how it happened, because otherwise that would have just, that would have confused me far too much. Uh, I needed to be able to keep track of the action, keep track of who was where and when. And I did have to make myself little notes um, in the, yeah, when I was writing saying, right, at this point, I'm this character, but I also need to know that this character is here doing this at the same time. You know, yeah, just because yeah. there are there are some things that have have that knock on effect on each other, even if they're not in the same place. So yeah, it was it was certainly more complicated. I don't know if I don't know how much I could say my process has changed. I'm still definitely a thorough plotter. I have to have the whole thing plotted out before I write it, otherwise I'm not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And and I think my my writing kind of routine and things haven't necessarily changed I'm not I'm not a thousand words a day sort of person I'm a sit down one day and write 10,000 and then don't write anything else for five days sort of person um <laughs> you kind of wait for inspiration to strike then and then just go right okay it has to be now sometimes sometimes it's just opportunity uh, it's just when I have the opportunity to sit down and write for you know a long time because I don't often get you know a full day to write so if I do then I sit down and do it um so it's it's a combination of that but I've I've always written like that even even when opportunity wasn't necessarily a, a difficult thing to come by so yeah I think it's just the way my brain works <laughs> you have to just go you with know. that really exactly yeah one thing I'm learning as I go <laughs> just go with how you how you need to work so let's talk about um the role the character of Emily mm -hmm. um so she is uh, her character is deaf and she wears mm -hmm. a cochlear implant mm -hmm. so how um important is it for you to obviously the silent series you've got lots of deaf characters in those mm -hmm. so how important is it that you have those deaf characters in your story and um and the sort of representation of deaf characters I think it's one of those that when I well going back to the science series again when I when I set out to write those that was because I wanted I wanted to portray a deaf community because mm. that was something I had seen so rarely in fiction whether it was in novels or on the telly um so that was that was something I really wanted to portray um and as you say I do have a wide variety of, of deaf characters within within those books with Emily 
I mean, I have gone a little bit down the route of using a deafness as a plot device, and I do accept that. Um, but I think I think part of it was that I think when when hearing people talk about deafness, it's often about what they would miss if they became deaf, and they don't necessarily think about um, challenges day-to-day -day challenges and also how it would affect you if you were in a crisis situation and so I thought you know that that's that's something really to um to put in there that you know how how is somebody going to deal with a crisis situation whilst also having one of their senses taken away from them so um that was it and, and Emily is quite a different deaf character from the deaf characters in my in my previous books because she is a cochlear implant user, but she's, she only uses spoken language. She doesn't use any sign language. She doesn't really have a deaf community around her. Mm. So I, you know, I wanted to put, to kind of portray a, a different, a different sort of character um, from, from the ones in, in the previous books. Does that make that's, sense? Yeah, that's actually one of the things that really struck me with the silent series. And one of the things I really loved about that and again, sort of, as you say, taking it further with Hyde, with Emily, um, was that was the variety of different deaf characters. You know, as a deaf person myself, I know that it's you're not either hearing or deaf at two ends of the spectrum. I know that deafness is all, you know, it looks all sorts of different um, colors. It's all, it's such an array of different things. You know, people mm -hmm. that, that are, first language, sign language, people that use hearing aids, people that don't, people who are oral, people who aren't, people who have different levels of hearing. And I loved the way that you really explored all that in, in, silent, in the silent series. And again, like you say, a completely different um, take on that in, in Hyde. Is that, are you kind of aware of that, that you, that you want to show the hearing community that there is all sorts of types of deafness is that something that's in your mind as you're writing them or yeah I mean that's that's certainly something I was I was wanting to include um I mean it's I, I always say I never never set out to educate I'm on you know I'm setting out to entertain that this is what my books are for um but if you know if I can portray uh maybe a, a community that a lot of people as you say aren't necessarily familiar with then then that's certainly something that um, that I'm pleased to do. And I think, I think that's it. I think because, because deaf people are in a very small minority, there's a lot of hearing people who've never come across a deaf person and their only experience of deafness will be something that they've seen on the TV um, or read about in a book. And so I think there is a lot of stereotyping. Yeah. I think there are a lot of assumptions about what deaf people can and can't do um and about what a deaf person is like as you say when really deaf people are as varied as hearing people whether it's their background or their um, language that they use or the job that they have or their education level or, or you know their ethnicity it's just you know this just a whole range of deaf people just as there are a whole range of hearing people and so that's yeah that's kind of how i wanted to wanted to put to to portray the community really that that I've that I've got I mean I I I have people from all walks of life and the same as I have I have victims as well as perpetrators you know I have <laughs> yeah it's, you know no it's pretty it, it, that was one of the things that really excited me about reading them I have to say it was great to see that variety portrayed in 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 the arts you know of some form it's really important um, so just to switch again slightly yes. topics. Um, so uh, yeah, so let's talk about um, the fact that all your books are thrillers uh, mm -hmm. and they can go to some quite dark places. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find that process? Do you, do you find it easy to go to those um, dark places in your mind or um, a little bit of insight into how Nell works? <laughs> You see, I feel bad if I say, yeah, it's easy. Um, <laughs> I feel like you'll be calling somebody. Um, no, I think, I think because, because I know it's not real, because I know it's all made up, I know it's all in my head, and because I ultimately know how it's going to end, mm. I think I don't find it as disturbing as I would if I were reading it and I didn't know how it was going to end, yeah. if that makes sense. 
Um, and obviously it's not as disturbing as if it were happening to a real person. However, all the things that I've written about are things that unfortunately do happen to real people. Um, <clears throat> so I, I don't know. There are certain crimes that I know I would find harder to write than, than others. And I think every, every crime writer has that. And I know a lot of crime writers say they'll never write violence against children. Mm. Um, and that's, you know, and that's fair enough because that is a place that they just don't want to go to. Um, and some say they'll never write animal cruelty. Again, something that they don't particularly want to go to. So it's, it's I think everyone's got their easier bits and their harder bits. And I think that's, that's partly to do with the way our brains work, partly to do with our own personal experiences. Um, partly to do with what we want our readers to to think as well so yes it's I think I'm quite good at compartmentalizing and and you know sticking with the whole yeah it's not real I know what's happening I know who did it and I know what's going to happen to them so yeah. <laughs> you know that makes sense that makes a lot of sense and yeah. do you like to read other crime books and watch thrillers and things or, or do you want to go to to Disney in your spare time. <laughs> no, no, no. I read. I read a lot of crime. Uh, I read a lot of crime and thrillers, and I watch a lot of a lot of uh, crime and thrillers. To be honest, the only thing I don't watch that's crime based is probably MasterChef. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I um, yes, I I am very much a, a crime and thriller reader. I I occasionally veer off into um, some bits of fantasy and sci-fi, but. But yeah, mostly, mostly what I what I devour is uh, is other crime books. Right. Um, and so, um, how have you found um, as a writer your career? Presumably, it's had peaks and troughs. Can you talk to us about uh, a high and a low? Or uh, oh, highs, high. Well, I'll start with the highs. Um, so, the Silent House was a USA Today bestseller, so that was quite exciting. Um, and also the uh, the silent series has been optioned for TV by a production company in the States. That was very exciting as well. So the possibility of it making its screen um, would be absolutely thrilling. Um, Lowe's, I mean, it, it's got to be the fact that last year I was booked at about mm, seven or eight different literary festivals. And of course, cancellation after cancellation after cancellation came in. In the end, I did a few online ones, but they're just not the same because you don't get to actually interact with the audience yeah. in person and talk to people and and mingle with real people. And that's that's something that really it was a huge disappointment because as well, you don't get to be a debut author more than once. Uh, <laughs> well, I suppose unless you completely reinvent yourself. But I don't think I don't think I'm going to become a romance author or anything anytime soon. I don't have the skills for that. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I yeah so I think I feel like I've I've missed out on on a chunk there of of not having that that kind of that excitement of being new and being a debut author and having seen all those panels and meeting all those people um but hopefully next year hopefully there'll be more things that I can go to in person hopefully people invite me to, to be on panels again <laughs> sure they will I'm sure they will had you always wanted to be a writer was that always sort of your dream yeah yeah I think so ever since I was young um it's not something I really actively pursued until uh, about 10 years ago and I wrote lots of books that weren't great <laughs> and uh, and had lots of rejections as as happens uh until I wrote The Silent House in 2016 I think um and yeah, I wrote that in 2016, signed with my agent in 2018, got a publishing contract in 2019. So eventually, you know, it all happened. But uh, yes, it was it was a long process, but I got there. Yeah. It's good to hear, though, because I think probably it must seem like a very daunting career to go into, because, as you say, I guess you just to be a writer, you have to write. So I imagine people have to you know you have to write that novel and then it go nowhere it must be so difficult to then go right okay well I'll try again with another one and just keep going so it's it's good yeah. to have this sort of perseverance when there's a lot of work before you see any reward regardless of whether you're going to traditional publishing or self-publishing 
you you have to write the book first before anybody can read it and you have to put a lot of work into it um before you get there and that is I think that's one thing why a lot of people might start writing a book but might not necessarily finish it um uh, because it is it is a lot of work and um you know to to put that much time and effort into something and to know that actually it might not go anywhere you have to really want it yeah yeah I guess you have to love it yes absolutely and what <laughs> Is there something that you do, do you have hobbies and things that you do to sort of take you away from, from that? Or do you end up reading other people's books or? Yeah, most, mostly reading to be honest. Um, I mean, cause writing, writing was my hobby and now, now it's, it's more of my job. Um, but, and as well, I have, I have a, a small child. So a lot of my time is taken up parenting as well. Um, but now I do like, I do like to spend a bit of time outside and, and go walking and things like that, which um is very good I think for my creativity in general because I think I often iron out plot points and get my head around scenes and things while I'm while I'm walking plus as well you know spot spot ideal locations for murders and <laughs> things yes, like that okay. inspiration <laughs> all around you that's it um and so uh, on Hyde then it, it it feels like a very wintry book mm -hmm. uh, lots of snow uh, mm -hmm. I don't think that's giving anything away to say that. <laughs> All right, I think we're safe with that. Yeah. Is there a favourite book that you like to read around Christmas or that you like to sort of snuggle in with? Well, I do. I, I am a big Agatha Christie fan, so <clears throat> she's she has a few that are uh, that are good kind of snowed in sort of mysteries. I mean, well, Murder on the Orient Express is a is a classic, uh, but then there's the Sitterford mystery as well, which is which is another um everyone's snowed in what are we going to do sort of sort of one so yeah, I I do like a bit of Agatha Christie particularly around Christmas or if I'm just having one of those days where I just want something nice and cozy to read mm. but still crime <laughs> obviously and do you find you do you ever read the same books more than once I do yes because I have a terrible memory uh, and so <laughs> And so I forget who did it, which is great. You know, I can watch, I can do, I can watch like episodes of Vera again and again as well because I can't remember who did it. Um, you know, my husband's sitting there going, obviously it was that person. We've seen it before. I can't remember that. So okay. yes, like I get the Christie books. I read over and over again, and some of them now I know, um, but there's quite a few still that I'm like, no, I don't remember. So yeah, I'm, it, you know, poor memory does have some advantage. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so well, we're coming to the, we've, I think we've covered loads of really great. Um, uh, so we're coming to the end of our very short half hour. Um, but lastly, let's talk, um, is it possible to have a little sneak preview snippet of what your next book might be about? Uh, okay, so my next book um, is about, hmm. So if you are just thinking about what I can say, yes. um, and as well, it's at the stage that, you know, if I say something, it might not make it through edits anyway. Uh, <laughs> so imagine you received an email that was intended for somebody else who happened to have the same name as you. Mm. And you became interested in who they were and their life, and maybe a little too interested. Oh. I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> yeah, that's... That's certainly captured on my <laughs> thing. Thank you. Well, uh, we have come to the end of our of our little chat. Thank you so much, Nell, for your time. It's been fascinating to hear um, about your process and about how you work. It's, it's brilliant. Um, thank you to Avon for, for making it happen today. Um, a little reminder, everyone, to get out there and get the book, um, which is released on the 9th of December. That will be the audio book as well with a bit of my voice yay um <laughs> ebook and paperback that's in the uk um, and to remind you that the silent series is also out in all good bookshops which um i can highly recommend um so to get reading folks you've got the whole of christmas sorted so uh thank you nell again and um i hope we'll see you soon thank you had a very nice chat thank you bye everyone bye, bye.